I was born in 1948, Dr. and Mrs. Pekela, Dr. Stanley and Evelyn Pekela, and uh, we lived a very comfortable life in the Berkshires, which is the center of uh, western Massachusetts. I um, was raised a Catholic. In fact, I was very active in my youth, St. Dominic Savio Club. I was a member when I was in grade school. I was also an altar boy for seven years. I uh, celebrated uh, that for a long time. Of course, I went through the traditional uh, First Communion, Confirmation, etc. And I uh, was a practicing Catholic and uh, for most of my uh, young adult life, young, my youth, uh, let's put it that way. Uh, after I graduated eighth grade, which was uh, a parochial school, I was taught by nuns up until eighth grade, uh, for a short a few years prior, I went to the local school, but then I think fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth, I went to uh, St. Joseph's. And um, then I, I went to a private school for high school. And at that time, I started uh, questioning a lot. That was a good break for me. I was a boarding school, it was a prep school, like, like I said. I was very active in uh, taking. Um, uh, Classes, you know, we, I, I studied philosophy, I studied Descartes, I studied Sartre, I studied all this. And that was as a, as a student. I graduated uh, uh, from uh, Cornwall Academy, Bella Victorian, and I was uh, supposed to go to any, uh, I had several choices, and I went to my father's alma mater, the University of Vermont, in Burlington, Vermont. And I started there in the fall of 66. I, I went through my first semester of my second year, and my professor of religious studies, comparative religion, said that there was a new temple, a new Hindu temple of some sort. He heard rumor up in, Mon up in Montreal. So uh, I had to do a paper for that class, and so he said I could do my paper on this new temple. So at the beginning, this was the beginning of the year, we had to pick a topic, and so we, we would spend that year or that semester, uh, researching that topic. And the topic I chose was this new Hindu temple. So I walked into the temple after ascending four flights of stairs, after I found it, finally. Uh, it was, uh, and I walked in, and it looked like a repurposed bowling alley, which is exactly what it was. And there was this, this shaped head, kind of a small individual standing there, and he was mumbling something. I'm not sure what he was saying at the time. I know now what he was saying. And as I walked in the door, he asked if he could help me, and I said, uh, I'm looking for a temple that's supposed to be in this building somewhere. And he says, you're here. This is, would you like to see God? And I said, well, I, I didn't expect as much, but uh, you know, if he's available, sure. <laughs> and so this is almost, this is after five minutes. This is what, his name is Shivananda. And Shivananda Das, he's also, he also, he was uh, like me, he was not in favor of the Vietnam War. And he ended up uh, having to leave the uh, Montreal area because they found out he was there uh, in lieu of the draft. But that's another story. I was there and he took me to see Lord Jagannath. And uh, when he took me to see Lord Jagannath, uh, of course, I genuflected, and he did his dandavats. And I, they, they, he was taking a plate off, and they were, he said, would you like some prashadam? And I said, uh, it depends. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> what is it? I mean, I didn't know if he was giving me drugs or mushrooms or what, you know? He says, no, it's sacred food. It's like you know, he, you know, I said, is it like communion? And he said, yeah, it's just like communion. And so then he gives me a chapati, a couple of chapatis. But I, I ate one, and the other one I kept. And I said, boy, you guys do it right. We only get little wafers back where I come from. And you've got this huge chapati. You call I, this huge wafer. I didn't even know a chapati. I didn't know. I didn't, never heard the term before. And so then I went and um, talked to him a little bit. It was a 
brief stay. He gave me a few photocopied or mimeographed BTGs, and there was no books in those days. This was 67. At least he had no books that I could afford, and I don't think, I think there may have been a book or two, and I, but I didn't get any books. I just had a BTG. And he mentioned, uh, he said, what are you here for? You know, why, why, what, what brought you here? And I said, well, I want to do a paper on, on, on this new temple. And that was my introduction. We saw the devotees on David Suskind. And by we, I mean me and my sister. So my sister, um, as soon as she saw them on David Suskind, and they explained everything, um, I kind of just said, wow, this is amazing. And, um, and then I realized that, you know, I really don't have anything <laughs> going on. <laughs> Just like I was thinking, this is what you do when you, when you don't have anything else going on. I realized I didn't have anything, you know. And then um, uh, my sister went to the temple like right away, right after David Susskind show and moved in and kept calling me, uh, bring me a blanket, bring me a box of tissues, bring me this, bring me that. And I started visiting the temple. And... Um, I recognized a lot of the devotees because for years and years and years I had seen the devotees um, dancing and chanting on 34th Street in the village, you know, at my school, uh, City College of New York, CCNY. And um, yeah. I was raised Catholic, but by that time I was distanced from the Catholic Church. Obviously, four years in a secular prep school, but I, um, I I was intrigued in speaking with him almost from the first few conversations. He kept me mentioning the Swamiji, and he kept mentioning the need for a preceptor or a guru, a, a teacher, and so I decided that's what I was going to do my paper on, is the the, the meaning of, or the need or the position of the preceptor in spiritual pursuits and spiritual life. And uh, then I had to start doing some serious reading. You know, I, then I read articles by Srila Prabhupada and um, but there was quite a, there was several weeks of nudging in between when I got to the point and an interesting story but you know, this can go on forever but uh, when he, when we had this discussion, uh, this was after several weeks, if not, you know, it was well into the semester and I was getting ready to do my paper. And um, it was in fact on the eve of when I was, you know, going to start writing it, uh, that he kept insisting on this, that you have to, this is descending knowledge, you have to get it from a realized source, you can't just make it up, you can't speculate. And I was bucking that because I was a speculator. I was, a, I was, you know, in the, you know, the, the American transcendental thing, you know, Th Thoreau and Emerson. But they even they referred to Bhagavad Gita, but um, but they never referred to Guru so much. So his concept was foreign to me. I mean, I, you know, I understood priests, but I wasn't very impressed with them. Um, but I, um, but he kept harping on that. And so when I I kind of walked out the door, I said. I said, he said, just like when you go back to the university, you have to follow signs. You have to follow the, 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 the road, the directions, or you'll get lost. And I said, no, I can do it blindfolded. I mean, and so a storm started, and I got lost. Now, it just so happened that going straight down, I, I, I veered, and I ended up going parallel to, uh, you know, instead of going this way, I started going... Let me see, going down there, it would be going west. But, and about, by the time I noticed that I had missed my exit, I was already halfway to a cabin that my parents had, because my mother was from Vermont. And uh, they had a cabin on Lake, uh, when, uh, uh, um, lake uh, it, uh, it's a big lake up there anyway, it's 21 miles long. Um, it's a big Indian name. And they had a cabin up there. I ended up being closer. I couldn't turn around. I was in a VW bug. 
and I, 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 the, the snow was already was over a foot deep, and I was going in that direction, so I kept going. And by the time I got within a half mile of that, uh, the, 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 the snow underneath it, I was already crossing the fields towards where the cabins were. And the, I had to abandon the car, and I walked to the cabin. I was snowbound for three days to write this paper. That was all Christian's direction. His, he just socked me there, and I, I spent the next three days totally snowbound. And, um, and that, that's when I realized that, yeah, you've got to watch directions. <laughs> so that's, I took it seriously from then. And, and then I wrote Prabhupada a letter. Uh, that was in January. I had to stay around for a while because I was the best man at my brother's wedding, which was that January, uh, or during the break, the Christmas break. It was just after New Year's. And, uh, and um, I remember the toast. I had, I had fake champagne. I had, everyone else had real, and I was already practicing. I, I can't touch that. That's alcohol. So I had this, and I said, everyone is looking, you know, for, for, for happiness. And uh, the only problem is the material world is full of, full of disappointment and, tre and problems. So, you know, and this wasn't the best toast at a wedding, <laughs> but I got away with it because they, I was always known as being a bit eccentric. So, but I wasn't shaved or anything. I was just, uh, you know, I was kind of a hippie because I had hair and beard, in fact. But um, uh, at any rate, um, I went straight back to the university after the break, and uh, I was worried about the draft. So I, I enrolled in all my classes and uh, packed up my bag, told my brother to come to the place. And I left the, the people that I was staying with, the, uh, the, the, the men, and there was, they were all, there was like four of us in this small apartment. I, I gave them the happenings record. I said, just keep listening to that. They were, they, they, they were getting sick of it after a while. They were either going to become devotees or get sick of it, but uh, I'm not sure what they did with it. But. I was playing it day in, day out. And I had that chapati, and that was another side story. I had that chapati, the first chapati, and I would take a little piece uh, until I went back to the temple. Srila Prabhupada to me is my Nitya Gurudev, and uh, he is, to me, he is a Manjari in the line of Rupa Goswami. And whenever the time comes, to go back to Godhead, he will be there to introduce me to Braj. And one time, Prabhupada, we were sitting in the room and there were some devotees talking. And uh, he said that the disciple and guru relationship is eternal. Even uh, if you, and he said that if you do not become perfect pure devotees in this life, I will come again in next life in some form of or other to guide you. And I will come again, third, and again and again, as many lives as you take to become pure devotee, I will keep coming to guide you, to take you back to Godhead. So then he said that please don't make me come again and again. Try and do work hard so that in maybe in one or two lives you finish or this life you finish. Don't make me come again and again like that he said. So this is the Guru. Uh, he's a Nitya Guru to me and until I am at in Braja with as in whatever my Siddha form is, my spiritual form, he will, he will be there all the way till that point and thereafter also. So our relationship will, is eternal. While I was still at the university, before I had actually withdrawn, I wrote Srila Prabhupada and I explained to him that I was not satisfied uh, with what I was doing there, I wanted to become more involved with uh, the teachings, with his teachings. And uh, I didn't get a response for a few weeks. And being uh, impetuous and, in, uh, you know, not, uh, not the most, um, um, not good at waiting. I left the university, did, as I said, 
withdrew everything, but I enrolled in classes because I was afraid of getting drafted. As soon as you got out, you get drafted. So I enrolled in classes. And I, I went uh, with a backpack to New York with a letter from Shivananda to show to, uh, as a, a bona fide uh, uh, in, you know, student. I wanted to, no, he said, this is what you do, you go there. And so I went there, and, and Brahmananda, uh, you know, greeted me and kind of, you know, saw the letter and invited me in, and I, I got my spot on the on the floor at 26 Second Avenue. And I had saved up about five or six or eight hundred dollars, whatever, and he he liked that. And he Prabhupada mentioned in the letter, he says, "Take care of that boy that that paid the rent or something like that 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 gave this money." And he apologized for not uh, uh, in his infinite you know, mercy, but he, he, Srila Prabhupada apologized for not writing sooner, but he was, he was traveling, and, you, you know, and I'm not sure, this was early in 68, this was January 68, and he said, uh, uh, you can come and live with me for a while, and then, but, uh, you know, don't have to worry about living, leaving the university. Well, I wrote him back immediately, and I said, I've already left the university, and he said, that's all right, the education may be bad, it may be bad, but studying is not bad, and you know, you know. So you educate yourself in my books now. If you left the university, fine, do it. But do it now. You continue to study. Don't 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 just drop the concept of education. But uh, use my books. My sister told me that um, that Srila Prabhupada was coming. And would I like to spend a few days at the temple? And I said, sure. And um, so I came and, um, you know, it just was life changing. I don't know how else to put it. It was life changing because I, I think even before I met Prabhupada, I saw his amazing qualities through his devotees. And um, I was really mesmerized by so many beautiful people. Like, I'd never met people like this before. And uh, Rukmini and <laughs> Ragatmaka, <laughs> you know, all these people. And uh, Ananga Manjari, you know, she, she was giving Brahma. So all the... I thought this was what the temple was like, but actually it was like all the um, temples in the Northeast had come down to Brooklyn to, because Prabhupada was there. So they were having Brahmatrini classes, and I would, Ananga Manjari would give those, and I was just, you know, loving it. And then Prabhupada came, and, and um, you know, I had been seeing pictures of Prabhupada for years, you know, and um, he was really, I, I remember he was just very small and very humble and, um, you know, but uh, when I went home after that three days, um, my roommate, um, Abby, um, showed me this album, and it was the Radha Krishna Temple album, and there's a picture of Srila Prabhupada on the back. And I said, oh, oh, that's my spiritual master to myself. And then I realized that I had that thought, and I just kind of brought me to tears that I had admitted that, that I had accepted him like that. When, when Srila Prabhupada came to New York, uh, we, of course, greeted him at the, at the airport. Uh, and uh, I thought he was larger than life. He looked like he was at least six or seven feet tall, and he was floating, and, you know, the, all the standard things I'm sure you've heard a million times. But he, he was magnificent and, and angelic, is all you can say. And, um, and he had... Um, that was the first. The first impression was this is this is. He was just. He was just the most um, genteel person I've ever seen. So, um, and he moved right into the apartment in the back there. And uh, one of the first things that happened after a few days, 
and this is to, to one of the first uh, things that uh, I, I had as an interaction with Srila Prabhupada is that uh, his, um, his drainage from his apartment was backing up. It wasn't working. It was backing up in that little courtyard back there. And so, you know, I'm a fix-it-up guy. So I grabbed the shovel and I started digging it. And the brahmacharya was saying, what are you doing? You know, this is sudra work. And I'm digging. said, no, Prabhupada, take it. It doesn't have a drain. I'm going to find out what's wrong. And I saw this stuff bubbling and I'm down there and slinging the mud around. And then, and then they went running up to Prabhupada. Prabhupada, Bhama Dave, I don't know if I was initiated, but I don't think I was yet. That, you know, Bhakta Bob is down there digging in the hole, digging in the thing. And, and he says, uh, he said, we shouldn't be doing that, should we? It's Muchi, isn't it? He says, no, that's devotional service. You know, he's, he, you know, so. Uh, he, um, so that was the first thing. I saw that Prabhupada was pragmatic and he was uh, extremely, uh, you know, he, 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 there, there was nothing phony. There was nothing that you could say, but... Uh, because I appreciated that. I think what, I don't know whether it's inspiration, but the event which made me come to Prabhupada is one service I did in London to one very beautiful looking devotee who was trying to sell magazines on the street. And he was covered by some Indian people who were demoralizing him by saying that he is doing a big mistake by being a, a follower of Krishna and that they are from India and they are going to, uh, that uh, they know all about this, this is heathen worship and you are a born Christian, you should not uh, do this. And uh, I felt this boy was sweating and feeling shaken up. And so I intervened in that crowd and I said to them that I'm also from India and, uh, you know, this is wonderful. Are you selling this magazine? Can I buy one of these magazines? And suddenly, as soon as I came there, those people went away and this boy was very, very blissful again and I bought the magazine and I even gave him some extra money and he became radiant and happy again. So. Uh, I think uh, when you serve a devotee of Krishna, that is what brings you. This is one service I did, which uh, brought me later on when I was in Canada. I came across the devotees and I joined over there. The first letter, in response to my letter, he told me to go and live with him. And uh, that he will train me up, or he will he will instruct me, because I was asking him all these questions. He said, "I will I will answer all your I will I will instruct you." And then when I didn't get that letter, of course, until I had already joined the movement, in in moving in sense, uh, in the second letter he said, "Well, then that may not be um, that that that's all right that you're there and you didn't come here, you know, because I didn't have any more money to go there." He said, "I will be coming to you." Uh, I'll be coming there, and we can we can talk then. He says. Uh, then he said, um, learning from Brahmananda because he is repeating everything that I say, is the same as learning from me. So you're in good hands, is the way he put it. So that told me a lot. Just that that letter alone showed me that first of all, Prabhupada had tremendous respect and and um, confidence in his leader devotees, that they would, they would be able to take the charge when Prabhupada wasn't there. And also that uh, Prabhupada, I mean, he doesn't know me. He, he said, come and live with me. And he actually invited me in three different times to come and live with me. Once I, I've, I was really having a dark moment, this is four, three, four, five years into the movement, and he says, come and stay with me for some time. I will dispel all your doubts. I didn't go, I came back, you know, to my senses. and. And things were right. But he, he invited me several times like that. So it's John Mastami, right? And, um, and this was the first time in my life I had ever fasted. And, um, and um, it was midnight already, and we, you know, we had the RT, because that's what you do on John Mastami. And I was thinking, okay, I can just get through this RT. And um, and and 
than, than we could take for Sodom. And um, Prabhupada was sitting on the Vyasa sun and we had beautiful Artik. And then it was time for the Nishringa prayers. And I was thinking only five more minutes. <laughs> and then, um, and then um, Kirtan was over and I kind of just shot up, you know, rare, ready and raring to go <laughs> for, for Sodom line. Um, and um, Prabhupada just remained sitting on the Vyasa sun and he said, uh, let's read from Krishna book. So they opened the Krishna book and um, read from the first chapter and that was the first time I ever heard the name Bhumi because um, in that chapter it explains that Bhumi um, went to the ocean of milk in, she assumed the form of a cow and went to the ocean of milk with Lord Brahma and um, was overburdened by all the demoniac kings and they were ple we, and she was pleading to Krishna to please appear on this earth and um, we read that whole chapter and then I was thinking wow now we can take Prasad <laughs> and then um, and then so the chapter was over and Prabhupada said keep reading Keep reading. So we read the second chapter. I, I know that, what is that chapter? The Prayers of the Personified Vedas. It's really long. I think we read that whole chapter. And I don't know if it's the, the second or the third chapter, but you know, we were, he was done reading. We read three chapters all together. And we read till two o'clock in the morning. And, and Prabhupada just sat there relishing the pastimes of Krishna and everybody else in the temple was temple room was falling asleep there were like there was Prabhupada and the altar with uh, Vrindavan Chandra and two rows of sannyasis and all their dundas were falling forward as they nodded off and uh, I just it was just such an I don't know it was a new life experience. And we finally, at 2 o'clock, we, we had a feast. And that was my first experience fasting in the presence of Srila Prabhupada, who had not a care about his body at all. He just drank in the nectar of the pastimes of Lord Krishna. After I had been uh, a devotee for some time, I was the uh, temple commander, as they called them in those days. I think they still have that position. Uh, and I took care of moving the drunks from the stoop and things like that so the people could come in and, because we were in the Bowery. It was, it was rough. But one day, this kind of a hippie fellow fought, walked in the door and he, he approached, brought, he said he wanted to talk to the to the to the the head guy, so I I went and got Brahmananda, and the head guy he came and he said I, I have some keys to a bus, and um, and he said, uh, he said I just want to give it to you, and uh, and he says and here here's my bill of sale, and he said you just have to write me out a bill of sale, so we wrote him out a bill of sale, you know for one dollar you know da -da -da, keys to a bus, and then he, he then Brahmananda gave me the keys to the bus and said go get it it was up in Woodstock. And, uh, you know, so here I am, the penniless brahmachari in New York, and I got to figure out how to get to Woodstock and get this bus. And I have no idea where the bus is or what condition it's in or anything. But it's a bus. And we figured, well, we can use a bus. We'll do something with it. So I made my way up there, you know, did a little, uh, as, as they call it, Sankirtan, got a few dollars and took a bus up to Woodstock. And, nosed around until I found a bus that the key fit. <laughs> and it didn't have a windshield and a few other things. And, uh, uh, you know, but I got it started. And uh, I drove it back to New York City. It was barely moving. It had no seats in it. It was painted with flowers and all this stuff. Um, and um, 
I drove it right through the Lincoln Tunnel, completely illegal. I had no idea. I'm not from New York. And I drove it right to the little Lower East Side, and I parked it right in front of the temple. I said, here's our bus. And I cleaned it up. And then I'll make this a little short because I don't want to go on and on. But it does interplay with Srila Prabhupada in a very, very beautiful way. Uh, it's been credited to someone else, but this is the real story. When you hear about the bus, this is coming from the source. I picked up the bus, I cleaned it up, and I drove the devotees from New York to where Bob Prabhupada was in Boston. And Boston and Prabhupada wanted to see this bus. <laughs> it was the first bus in his car. Okay? So I pull up to, to the temple, and there's no seats in the bus but the driver's seat. Prabhupada wanted to go for a ride in the bus. So they go, oh boy, what are we going to do now? So we went and got a chair, and the devotees, similar to these chairs, put it right next to me, and they were holding a seat, and the, the, as many devotees as could stuff in that bus. It was a big bus, it was a school bus. And it, but it was, you know, it was clean. I, I cleaned it because I was getting ready to try to sell it. I even put a kind of a windshield in it of sorts. Uh, and it didn't have windshield wipers, so it's kind of hard when it rains, you had to stick your head out like this. So, but it, it worked. Uh, so anyway, we, he wanted to go to the pier where he, where he landed. So I was driving him, and I didn't know the directions well, but uh, some devotee was coaxing me, you know, go here, because I wasn't from Boston, I was from Western Mass. So one of, the, one of the things that stayed to me and to this point, to this place in my life right now, I'm still here, was that uh, as we were going by, there was a lot of construction. They were taking this building, it was, pro it was probably several stories high, not a huge building, but they were going to build a skyscraper or a new building, but it was perfect in shape. There's nothing wrong with it. But he was watching it being hit by the ball. And Prabhupada said, that, that should not happen. That is a waste. He said, you should, re, you should use these things for Krishna. Just repurpose them. So ever since then, you know, now we have all this recycling and stuff. So, but Prabhupada was the first one to, to see the, 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 the uh, benefit in repurposing and, and reusing things. Just changing it. Don't just change it for the sake of changing it. Repurpose it. And don't just destroy and rebuild, destroy and rebuild. That was the, the thing that he was against. That just remove it and start again, remove it, and just waste all this materials is going down into landfills, and, and then you build, the, build it back. And he said, that's all, that's all uh, a waste, repurpose. So that was, that was the, 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 the takeaway from that. Is, is, uh, uh, and uh, we, we, we went there, and we parked, and we walked a little bit and walked back. And, and, uh, came back with the bus, and then, then uh, he said, no, you should sell this bus. <laughs> so that, that's another story. It doesn't, that's all Prabhupada told me to do with it. So I took it back to New York, and I put some incense burning it, and I played some music, had some devotees in it, and we went around the village and, with a big for sale sign on it, and I ended up getting five or $600 for it. One particular incident which uh, was very important for me was that in Hyderabad we had finished the temple and the next day was the inauguration of the temple and this Vengal Rao who was the chief minister was coming to inaugurate and there was a big ceremony going on everything was happening but uh, it was a last minute thing and uh, temple cleaning was going on so that particular night before uh, all the devotees who were there, the brahmacharis and us all, we were just polishing and cleaning. And we finished work at about 2.33 in the morning. And uh, finally at about 2.33, I sent everyone off and I checked everything, that everything is fine, now it's all done. And I was going up to my room and I was so tired that I couldn't walk up to my room. And I just slept on the staircase, not far from Prabhupada's room. 4.30 Mangalati happened, and at, uh, after Mangalati, uh, there was a devotee called Palika Devi. She was Bhavananda's wife. She came and woke me up on the steps. She says, what are you doing here? Go quickly, Prabhupada wants to meet you immediately. So I quickly ran and had a cold bath and within five minutes or seven minutes I was in his room. 
and I was exact. I was full with happiness. I was full with uh, exhilaration that oh, we did. I did a good job, and I entered with that feeling, you know. And I said, I paid my obeisances with full happiness, and Prabhupada was furious. He was so furious. He was. He just broke me to pieces. He says, where were you? I, because from his room he can see the temple and he can see the Mangalati. He says, where was, where was everyone in Mangalati? He said, where was everyone in Mangalati? Because nobody came. They finished work at 2.30. You know, I also was very tired. So we didn't go to Mangalati. He says, where was everyone in Mangalati? Nobody was there in Mangalati. was empty. So I said, I, I answered back. But Prabhupada, the devotees worked very hard till 2.30 in the night, you know. And when I said that, he was furious. He says, devotee? Who is the devotee here? You call yourself devotee? You are useless, malacha, this, that and what not, he sweared. When he gets angry, he can say many things, you know. So he was furious and he was saying, you, you call yourself devotee, how many years have you been doing any service and you call yourself devotee? You know, and he said so many strong words which I cannot exactly remember now, but it, all, it brought me to tears and I was just about to break down. And then when he saw that, he suddenly changed and he became opposite. And he says, you know, Mahamsa, the Goswamis of Vrindavan, the six Goswamis, Rupa Goswami, Sanatan Goswami, they were seeing Krishna all the time, he said. They were seeing Krishna all the time. Krishna was with them in their heart all the time. But they never thought that they were devotee. They were always running from one tree to another tree. Where is Krishna? When will I be blessed to see Krishna? When will I visit, uh, have darshan of Krishna? When will Krishna come to me? They were always in that mood that I am most unfortunate. Krishna is not available to me. This is, they, they are seeing Krishna, but they never think that they are devotee. So, trenada pi suni chena tarora pi sahishnu na amani na mana dena kirtanya sadhani. Don't this is how he explained, which, that is all, that's all he said. And this I'll never forget. This I'll never forget, because this is the key to loving sentiment, humility. Without humility, the doors don't open. Without humility, you cannot say, na dhanam na janam na sundarim va kavitam va jagadisha kamara. You cannot say that, first that humility. And after that, other things of the shikshas to come, come. So in, this is one mood of Prabhupada I saw of him in Braja. Today when I reflect on that, that is why I feel he is a manjari of Rupa Goswami. And he is assisting Rupa Goswami in, in the pastimes of Krishna. And the Goswamis were running mad, one, he said, running one tree to another tree, running to, to the birds and to the bees, like how Radharani was talking to the bumblebee. The Goswamis were doing that. And they never thought that I am a great devotee. This teaching of his is most striking to me. I went to a class, in, uh, and this is after I had been working for a week or two. I went to the, a class, and I was there at the end of the class, I came in the door. And as I came in the door, Prabhupada had just finished the lecture, and I, 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 I heard the last few minutes of the lecture, but he looked and he saw me, and he said, where have you been, Vaman and Dave? And I, you know, oops, <laughs> I said, I, I, I got a job through the Prabhupada, I'm working. I'm developing my skills as a builder, as a carpenter, so I can build uh, temples or build, build for Krishna, something like that. I have it recorded. It's actually in the tape archive. And he, then he just, he just he looked at me and just went, oh, that's all right. 
and he just went like that, like just like a doting father. I mean, like you know, like he knew I was in my head, but you know, you know that's all right, that's all right, just chant. So it was really beautiful. It was really beautiful, and I, I got I got a sense of uh, a real connection with Srila Prabhupada from that, and from you know many instances like that, where he uh, invites me to live with him, and, uh, and there's another one to uh, come to later. Fast forward uh, six months, it's time for my initiation. It was um, April 1973. Srila Prabhupada was in New York and there at the initiation. So um, it is now May 2023, so um, it's been 50 years now. It's my anniversary. So, um, so um, Prabhupada was there at the initiation, but um, I didn't know it then, but I don't think he was feeling real well. So uh, Brahmananda was, um, he Prabhupada was sitting there on the Vyasasan and Brahmananda was giving the names out and handing us the beads and asking us the four r rules and regs. So um, then he told me my name was Bhumi. And um, I recognized that name from <laughs> New Vrindavan. And, um, you know, I was, I was a little disappointed. I didn't really, my, and then my mother was there and she goes, I gave you such a beautiful name, I, the name Nina. And what do you need a new name for? <laughs> my mom said. So anyhow. This is, this is uh, probably the most direct uh, and meaningful, uh, impactful instance I had with Srila Prabhupada. And I was um, in this interim period still, and I was, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, I would come for, for meals and, and chant some japa and then go to work. And there was this young lady with a child, a very young infant, a couple months old, a couple weeks old, I don't know, but very young and very vulnerable. And I have a very compassionate or soft heart and I, you know, I kind of just talked to her and ate prashadam with her a few times and I, I, there was some, some attraction, but in those days, that's, a, you know, if you were eating prashadam with someone or going for a walk with someone, you're going to marry that person. That was as simple as that. I mean, you know, and I was a brahmachari, I was an initiated devotee, and you just don't do that unless you have those designs. I had a job, you know, so that so the word got out, and this is, you know, we were doing this for all of a week, maybe three or four times we did it, and the word got out that um, Bam and Dave was going to get married, and I got word of that secondhand, and uh, and then. Um, my brahmacharya friends would say, you know, you, you got to be careful. You don't want to do that. You know, she's already got a child. You know, you're going to be in trouble. This, you know, you know, you don't have that good a job. I mean, it's just you're working, you know, in a sweatshop. You know, it's making furniture. It's not really high pay. You got, you know, be careful. You know, and so I said, oh, geez. And so one of them said that that Prabhupada had said that if a woman has a child, she should be satisfied. So I said, oh, that's a good out. And so then the next time I met her, and you know, we, we were chanting and or eating prasadam or something, I said, and by the way, you know, we can't get married, so, you know, I think, uh, just wanted to let that out, you know, and tell you this. And she said, oh yeah, okay, okay. Well, we hadn't really talked about it, but it was just understood. And so I said, and Prabhupada said that you should be satisfied. That, you know, you have this child, and just be satisfied, and, you know, have a happy life, and see you later. <laughs> you know, and so I just went off to my job, and and I came back for lunch, or maybe this was the weekend. Prabhupada wants to see me in his room. Now I was often called to Prabhupada's room to do little things, not real interaction. Just when he was gone for a walk, I'd go to fix the door or something like that. But this time he wanted to talk to me. I said, "Oh, great!" So I went running out in my obeisances and and how can I serve you, Prabhupada? How can I serve you, Swamiji? Because he was Swamiji at that time. And he said, did I tell you, you cannot marry this girl? And I was 
you know, I just did a double take. And I said, no, no, I haven't spoken to you about it. You've never mentioned anything to me about marrying anyone. He said, and then he looked to his servant and said, see, I did not say that. And he looked at me and says, you were used your spiritual master for your own purpose. He says, don't ever do that. You have hurt this girl by this, and you have put me in on the spot. He says, you must leave L.A. now, and I want you to take Govinda Dasi to her husband. He, she needs an escort. So you move her stuff into the, to the airlines, get a ticket, fly with her, and get her to her husband. But you have to leave. So I was banned from L.A. I was told by my spiritual master that I had to leave. So that was, but it was the most mercy I ever got. So the lesson I learned from uh, that interaction with Srila Prabhupada and the situation with this young lady was that, um, that your spiritual master is not someone that you use for your own benefit. He said, don't use your spiritual master for your benefit. Uh, don't, don't, uh, you know, don't use, don't, and it, it was really, it really stuck with me. And don't, just because someone said, Prabhupada said, uh, doesn't mean that it pertains to any particular circumstance that you might try to twist into it. Don't try to twist Prabhupada's words for your own convenience, for your own, uh, you know, to make yourself look better, uh, or to rationalize what it is you want to do. So in that sense, I, that's what I learned from that. And so I don't believe anything that, that people say unless it's written in his books. And I realize that the, the book's also contextualized, so read it in its totality. Prabhupada said, he, he's also quoted as saying, Prabhupada, there's so many things I, they have said, I have said, I have not said. So in any way, they're all particular things, so don't, don't, uh, don't use your spiritual master for your own purposes. That's my takeaway. After I left Iskon, I uh, kind of uh, stayed away. It was, uh, to me, it is a reaction to my Vaishnava Prad. Because when I was in my final years of Iskon, I did a lot of fighting with my own god brothers over ego issues. We were into an ego trip. I was into a major ego trip of I and mine in ISKCON. And in that process, in the GBC meetings and in other uh, situations, I was fighting very strongly with my god brothers. And these were not ordinary fights, it was nasty fighting. And because I committed so many offenses against other devotees, my god brothers as devotees, the punishment of that was that I, after leaving Iskon, I had no satsang of devotees. My only satsang was with Prabhupada and through his leelas. But I had no personal association with devotees. And that was very difficult and very paining, painstaking. So anyway, during that time, I traveled all over dhams like Badrinath Dham, Gomuk. I did all these yatras. I went to Amarnath, I went to Muktinath, I went to all these places, uh, dhams, and traveled as a sadhu. I grew my hair, I had a beard, so I used to dress like a sadhu and travel with the sadhus all over India. I went to every Kumbha Mela. I stayed in Kumbha Mela for a whole month and I mixed with all the sadhus of all, all types, Vaishnava sadhus, Sitaram Babas, Naga Babas, uh, Shankaracharya Bhaktas, uh, all types of sadhus I met in my experiences. Because when you travel, I used to be, walk with them, sleep with them, eat with them, beg with them, sleep with them. I, like an ordinary sadhu on the road, like these mendicant sadhus, sometimes I would go like that. 
and so I had experience of all types of sadhus. All types I had experience. But every time I'd meet them and some discussion would come out and I would see their lifestyle and I would see their... Uh, I respect all sadhus. I give my respect to every sadhu. But in my heart, every time Prabhupada shines out because none of them, none, could give what Prabhupada is giving. None of them would give what we are getting through this line of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This disciplic succession of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is, is the core. There is no other sadhu or philosophy or uh, anything that can be compared to the greatness of this understanding Braja Leela. Braja Leela, only Chaitanya Mahaprabhu line of disciplic succession gives. Even the Ramanujas, the Vallabhacharyas, the Sri Sampradaya, all these Vaishnav Sampradayas, they go to some level. But Braj Leela, the depth of Braj Leela that Prabhupada has exposed us to, he has exposed it, now we have to search. He is always there. He is always there to be with us in, in our search. As I said, he is a Nitya Guru. He is always there. But we can learn from many others also. So, no sadhu in India, and I met them all, is, has been able to, uh, which I can see, has given us this. And the purity of Prabhupada is selflessness is uh, total 100% giving to Krishna is uh, I have not seen anywhere. Well, the next uh, thing I recall was I went to uh, Hawaii uh, and there I joined the Carpenters Union. I was working at Pearl Harbor. I lost contact with the devotees because they moved and it took a few weeks uh, before I stumbled upon a Sankirtan party in, in uh, downtown Honolulu somewhere, and I said, Prabhupada, and they said, Prabhupada's in town. I said, where? And they said, he's in a farmhouse in Kaaba. So I uh, didn't know the, the island that well, but I did know it, and I, I knew I had an emergency brake that I used for braking. So anyway, I made my way, and I pulled up up the driveway, and, and uh, I could tell right away it was devotees that were there. So I walked in, and they were making lunch for Srila Prabhupada. He was there. He was in the back room. In his, he, they always had a special darshan room for Srila Prabhupada where he, used, he was writing, translating, received guests. Uh, and it was almost earshot from the uh, kitchen because it was a small house. And I was there, and they were um, making prasadam. And as I was speaking to him, um, um, Prabhupada said, Is that you, Vamande? Vamande, come here. And so I went, he says, where have you, he said again to me, you know, where, where are you? Where have you been? What are you, where, what are you doing? And I said, well, I have a job now, a real job. I, I'm building a, a building uh, at Pearl Harbor. And, uh, and then uh, and the first thing he said to me, are you chanting? He didn't say I was, if I was chanting 16 rounds or anything. He says, are you still chanting? And I said, yes, Srila Prabhupada, I chant as much as I can. You know, I am chanting, and I and I am following. You know, and he said, "That's all right." He was so he, he wasn't grilling me. He wasn't giving me a hard time. He wanted to know that I was still in touch with with the process, and uh, the, the the feeling I got was one of a of a father uh, of a of a loving, doting, or caring um, um, guardian father. I was in JFK Airport in New York City and my service was to distribute Srila Prabhupada's books in the airport and Srila Prabhupada just happened to be um, leaving that day so we decided, I was, I was with my um, distribution uh, partner Sunita and um, we 
And as Srila Prabhupada came in and sat down in the waiting area, we were distributing books in front of him. And um, this story is actually um, written down in um, the little supplemental red books that Satsvarup Maharaj put out. Uh, she wrote the story, and so she has a better memory than I do. And, um, but um, evidently, we were distributing books right with Srila Prabhupada standing there. And of course, we were telling them that we were showing the people that the author of this book is sitting right here. <laughs> And um, so um, people were like, oh, oh, and they were really buying the books and everything. Prabhupada was watching us. So um, I don't know. That was quite an honor to be able to do that. I told Prabhupada that I was getting, I, I got a draft notice because they realized I was, had left the university. Because by this time, it was well into the second semester, I got all F's, surprisingly. Because I, but the, it worked. It gave me enough time to get my, my foot set in Krishna consciousness and to figure out what I should do. So uh, I was planning to become a CB, to build, to go into the service and, and work as a CB. That's, that's a person that builds the temporary shelters for the soldiers, non-combatant role. But he said no. He says, you shouldn't have anything to do with it. You should approach it and be a, a conscientious objector. Someone, he mentioned someone, I'm not sure who it was, Subal or somebody that had gotten it and they had been approved. He said, you are, you are a student. You are my student. You are a theological student. You are, you are a, um, a Brahmana. By, you, know, you may be doing you know, carpentry or whatever, but you'll be teaching carpentry. You, you're, you're, you're a student of Krishna consciousness. And he says, you don't do this. You're not going to this. You shouldn't do that. You should fight it. So I called my father, who was a well-placed, you know, persons like Dan Quayle. And he made an appointment for me. I had to fly all the way to Boston, and I got a conscientious objector. And uh, it was the basis of that. And, and so that he, he saved me. You know, he saved me from that, because so many people didn't come back in one piece. Or at least, even mentally, they, they got damaged. But he didn't want me to do that. Prabhupada used to, uh, because, uh, I don't know how to say it, but he used to tell me to meet a lot of his god-brothers, Prabhupada. I used to go to the Bombay Gaudiamat often, and I used to meet his god-brothers quite often. And uh, I, I feel that there was one, in, there was at one level an intimate relationship with Prabhupada and his god-brothers. Although, at, on one level there were some criticisms also, where his god-brothers may have criticized him and he may have criticized his god-brothers. But there was another level of uh, high interaction, which was at that time beyond my understanding. And so, after his disappearance, uh, we were all very young devotees. We were hardly eight, nine, ten, twelve years with him. Many people during his uh, last days, there was uh, just about two, two weeks before he disappeared, in October, I think, he called all of us, the GBC members, and he asked us what, he just asked us to come and ask what we wanted. So each of the devotees went and said what they wanted. They wanted this position, this, 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 this. And during that time, there was a group of Indian devotees, I think I, I had taken Mr. Hari Prasad Badruka in there and there were some other senior devotees, uh, Indian, not devotees, they were, they were devotees but they were Indian uh, supporters of ISKCON, senior, uh, important people. And the discussion at that time was that 
they were telling Prabhupada that you should nominate one person to succeed you. Like in all other ashrams, the Guru nominates one person to succeed and then we will all back that person. And Prabhupada at that time said, there is no that one person. And he said, I have to make the best use of a bad bargain. These are the words I'll never forget. He says, I have to make the best use of a bad bargain. The bad bargain is that, not that we are bad people, not that we are bad devotees, but the bargain is that I have to leave this planet so soon and I have not been able to train any of my disciples to come to that level. And therefore, I, I nominate the GBC and I nominate these 11 people to do the Diksha and uh, I hope my God brothers will help. This was the message he gave. But after he left, I feel uh, there was a little, in the leadership, there was a little antagonism with the leaders of Iskon and his God brothers, which I think would, if, if that was avoided, we would have been a better organization today. There was antagonism between the leaders and his God brothers. They are also great devotees and we should not create offense against them also. And this is, I think, one mistake that we made, for which I have suffered for which some of my god brothers, senior god brothers have suffered and for which Iskan has suffered. This is something I feel. Now I think things are okay and things are back in in shape. After all, and, and, and Prabhupada said that this is not my moment, this is Lord Krishna's moment, Chaitanya Dev's moment. He will take care of everything. In that particular meeting, this is what he said, that this is not my, I'm just a messenger, I'm just a, one of the persons. This Krishna's movement, Krishna and Chaitanya Dev will take care of everything. And they have taken care, Iskon is growing everywhere. And, but it did take a dip. In the earlier days, it, it took a dip. A lot of God brothers left the organization. And, uh, but, uh, it could have been better, but I was a part of it. I also was a part, although I never, I never abused any of his god brothers. I always respect them within my heart as, as great Vaishnavas. This offense against Vaishnavas is something in our madness we do, but then afterwards we will be repent. The major thing that Prabhupada wanted, because he wanted us to preach to college in colleges. I had a Bhakti Yoga Society at Washington University, and um, we made several devotees from there. He, he wanted us uh, to, uh, to, to, you know, to influence the, uh, the intelligent people. And, and also seekers of all kinds. It just so happened, I didn't know, I'd never been to St. Louis, but I ended up a block from Lindell and, and McLeod, which was like the Haight-Asbury area, all the head shops and stuff, and Forest Park was there, and this was when the Kent State Massacre happened and all that, and we had kirtan parties and prashadam, and people were just coming in droves. I made the front page of the, the St. Louis uh, 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 Weekend uh, Happenings magazine. Hare Krishna comes, to, uh, you know, so that, and I sent that to Prabhupada, he was very pleased. So he really encouraged uh, householders at that time to start temples. I was um, in the New York temple and um, they were starting to open up airports all over the country um, to, so that we could distribute books and then Barry Fisher was opening them up and um, Atlanta Airport had just opened up. 
it, it is not like the giant hub it is now. It was uh, a smallish airport at that time, and um, but they sent me the, um, they sent me down there to distribute books, and um, I knew that Srila Prabhupada was coming to New York in a few weeks, so I really didn't want to go because I wanted to see Srila Prabhupada, but. I surrendered and I went down to Atlanta and lo and behold Srila Prabhupada ended up coming to Atlanta the only time I think he was ever in the Atlanta temple so um, I don't remember greeting him at the airport but I do remember that when he came in and he sat in the temple room um, on the Vyasa Sun he said I have I was just in Mexico City, I was in Caracas, I, I was in Miami, <laughs> he said it like that. He said, but I see you have the best temple. <laughs> and, uh, and also in, um, I remember that um, we had a question and answer period and one boy was kind of asking, Srila Prabhupada kind of one of those questions where he was anticipating a response um, and he said Srila Prabhupada what pleases you the most and Srila Prabhupada he expected Srila Prabhupada to say if you distribute my books but Srila Prabhupada said if you love Krishna that will please me and also in Atlanta was um, I I was not a cook in those days. I was a sankirtan devotee, but <clears throat> they needed people to um, cook Prabhupada's lunch. So um, I, I knew how to cook because you know my mother was a sensational cook, and um, and I and they, we also have the Hare Krishna cookbook. So I made Srila Prabhupada um, Erd Dal Kachoris. That's the end in my life. That's the only thing I ever made for Srila Prabhupada was Erdal Kachoris, which happened to be his favorite. And um, so um, the plate went in and um, all of the us that were cooking, we sat outside the door, you know, waiting for the plate to come out. And I was anxiously waiting to see if he had eaten any of the kachoris, and, and there were two kachoris missing, so uh, that <laughs> he had eaten two kachoris. So I was very happy. I operated the temple, and I got the desire to go to Dallas, but en route to Dallas, I, I did a little tour. Uh, I went, I talked, because I had been stationed for two years doing my conscience objector thing and working in the hospital and managing the temple. Organized. Now, I bought the temple. It was just a small building, but uh, I bought it with a, uh, from a, an elderly couple that were relying on the payment for their pension because I bought it out there. I had no money. I talked them into selling it, please, and you take back the mortgage and I'll pay you. And so they sold it to me. It just, just boom, like that. So anyway, I, I, I handed it over to the, uh, to the temple, Six Aiding Temple, I'm not mentioning names. But, uh, and I, I uh, went for a little tour. I had a, a, a VW van at that time, and, and then we, uh, we, we ended up in Oklahoma City for a short while, a couple months, because I, I wanted a breather, and I started a small temple there. It wasn't really a temple, I just wrote Hare Krishna on the on a porch, it was on a main street, and I came back from work and there was a whole room full of devotees. A traveling party caught me. They found me. And it was just north of Dallas. It was in Oklahoma City, outside of Oklahoma City. And so I said, yeah, I was just taking a break for a while. And so we had Prashadam and they talked me into coming there. So I started in the Gurley Street. They were just, they needed a lot of help there. And I'm a builder by then. And so I, I did a lot of work there. And after being there for several months, I found out, maybe six months, that they closed my temple in St. Louis. I was, I, I didn't even think. I got in my truck, put my tools in it, and I just, I left my wife and ch child there. At the time, I only had the one child. I ended up having four, but I ended up with one child. And I went to St. Louis. 
And I started taking the, 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 the boards off the thing, and I opened it up, and they said, you can't do that, the GVC or the Temple, I, let's say, I won't say the word GVC, but they, so cut that one out. But the, the Temple authorities told me that, you know, that, that temple is closed. I said, you can't close it. They're just letting it go. Those people need the money. That's on me. I, I made back the, all the rent. I gave them the money. They were, they were happy. And, uh, you know, and I reopened the temple. And, and then Prop, and, and I wrote Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I have to open this temple. He said, of course. And he said, and then he just told the, 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 the leaders, he said, leave Mom and Dave alone. <laughs> Let him do it. You know, he's a special case. Let him do it. <laughs> so I got it going again. It never closed. Never closed. What I, what I felt from Prabhupada was that I had my backer. I had someone that, that had faith that, that I was going to do it and that, that, that it was the right thing to do and uh, that it should be done and that I wasn't easily dissuaded and I was determined. I was determined to start it, I determined to build it and I was determined to reopen it and I could do it because I could make it happen and I made it happen and it stuck and I'm glad for that. And I, I told this to the, about a year ago or so they, they contacted me from St. Louis and they wanted to know the story of St. Louis but it's just on phone. And I, I told him, I said, you, you almost weren't there. <laughs> and I told him that little story. We went, um, in 1975, we went to India for the opening of the uh, Mayapur Temple and the Krishna Balaram Mandir. And we were there for six weeks with Srila Prabhupada. And during that six weeks, we took a side trip to Hyderabad and um, and there was a sweet maker, a Bengali sweet maker there named G. Pularetti and he had a big home in Hyderabad and he invited all the devotees over for lunch. So a big group of us went and were uh, taking prasadam on the front lawn. Srila Prabhupada was in the house. And um, after I was done, I was looking for a um, place to wash my hands and walked into the house and there's the door was open and I saw that Srila Prabhupada was in this little room and he was talking to the family, uh, I guess the Pularetis, and, um, and there were um, um, th at least three of the ladies of the house and some of the men too and I I, I was thinking, should I go in, should I not go in? But I decided, do it, do it. You'll never get a chance <laughs> again, just go in. And uh, so I went in and I sat down really close to Srila Prabhupada. And um, uh, Srila Prabhupada was talking to the ladies of the house and, and they were laughing and it was very jovial and he was telling them about how you know when women come in the picture everything gets complicated <laughs> and um, and then he said even Lord Ram he was God himself but when but when Sita came in the picture then there was so much trouble <laughs> And and all the time they were laughing, and uh, he's you know Prabhupada had a beautiful sense of humor. And oh, and the other thing about that is that um, people kept coming in the room because when I went in, it was I was maybe the first devotee, and then the second devotee came in, third devotee, and before you knew, the whole room was filling up. And then there were windows, and then they, they were standing outside and looking in the windows, and there's just like people everywhere, everywhere by the time it was finished. It was, it was maybe the most intimate um, association I ever had with Prabhupada. And, and very funny, because I, I like humor, and <laughs> Prabhupada had the best humor. So another encounter I had with Srila Prabhupada, there, were, there was two walks I went on, uh, and one that I remember distinctly, uh, walking in Dallas at some 
um, forested and wooded area. And um, Prabhupada would ask what type of tree this is or what type of plant. And he was, he was shocked that we were pretty much dull. And uh, he knew more, and he was from India. You know, he knew more about his environment. We, we walked through, and so it, it just struck me that he was very aware and wanted to learn, wanted to know these things just because it's just, the, you know, to just know what's there in front of you. But um, another time in Dallas, we were standing, we were, I was uh, taking, I, I used to be, um, whenever he would sit on the back, on the, this, this uh, sidewalk area near the, off the temple, it was a, a place where he could get some fresh air from his room. Um, either on Gurley Street or on that other street, I can't remember, but it was, very, it was just a sidewalk area. And it was an area that um, got very hot in the afternoon. The sun came up and it was really hot. And so we were trying to fan him, and it wasn't working. So he said, go get some water. So someone went and got a bucket of water, and I was watching. And Prabhupada took the water, and he said, now pour it on the concrete. And they just poured water on the concrete. And it was so hot, it just steamed up. And then he said, now fan me. And he said, this is how we do it in India. And I said, wow. <laughs> There's nothing Prabhupada doesn't know. <laughs> There's no way that, I mean, he's so organic and, and, and so much in touch with what's around him. So those two things were uh, lessons of be aware of your surroundings and how to use your surroundings, how to know your surroundings so that you can better, uh, better serve, better be more um, in tune. We were in the, um, so many of the pastimes that, um, I remember with Srila Prabhupada happened in the airport. And we were in the United Terminal and Srila Prabhupada was departing. And um, we would always know, we, we knew how to work the airports because we were there every day. So we found out, you know, where his plane, which plane was going to Dallas or wherever he was going. And, um, and, and we were there like waiting for him at the terminal. So um, I had a really, really good seat and um, there's pictures of it too, you know. And I'm, uh, um, I'm sitting um, like right in the front, um, maybe the second row or something like that. And uh, Srila Prabhupada, I had a Krishna book on my lap and uh, we were sitting there for a while and then Srila Prabhupada noticed the Krishna book and he said, you read to everybody. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I said, what shall I read? And Srila Prabhupada said, you open anywhere. It's like sugar. It doesn't matter what side of the sugar you taste, it's sweet. And so I read the story of um, Krishna kidnapping Rukmini and Tishila Prabhupada. I got that special time with them. Well, everything I know about spiritual life is through Prabhupada's books. And his books have uh, everything in it. And even till today, even after Prabhupada is not only in his physical form, even after he left his body, he still is our guru and he comes in many forms. Sometimes he, he gives wisdom through the heart or through the mind and through his books. He's always there in his books and we read those books and at every level he's, uh, he's giving the inspiration till today. Today, the same book I read again and again, but the but the wisdom is different. The the realization is different. And I remember just before he got sick, just before he went to Brindavan. Actually, uh, before that, he called me one day to his room. And he said that there is one thing I have not done which I want to finish. And I want to finish the Bhagavatam, the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. 
and he said, I cannot do it with all this management. I want to go to Kodaikanal where his personal Dr. Ghosh, Dr. Ghosh was his personal uh, uh, health advisor. He had a lot of confidence in Dr. Ghosh. So he says, I want to go in Kote Kanal. You please arrange with Dr. Ghosh for me to stay at his house. And I, for six months, I want to be there and do my translation of the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. So by the time I went there and we started building a room for Prabhupada and got trying to get the arrangement made, uh, he felt more sick and then from Bombay he went to Vrindavan and then he continued and stayed in Vrindavan. So he could not do that and I think that was what he really uh, felt um, something unfinished in his experience. He could not finish the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. He wanted to do that very badly. He wanted to cut out because Kodi Kanal, there was not much chance for uh, communication. Therefore, he wanted to be isolated. So management would be taken care of by his other servants and he could be concentrating. He needed some six months to finish the 10th canto. This was, I think, his last uh, desire in active service and uh, he could not do that. But his greatest contribution, I think, besides the many other, everything he did is a great contribution, but his books are his greatest con contribution. Srila Prabhupada is, is, uh, is the most kind and honest merciful, gentle, and uh, gentlemanly person that, uh, that could possibly be. He, he, he doesn't have an envious bone in his body. He's not, uh, you know, if there is such a thing of, of, uh, of, of uh, anger, it's, it's not the same as our anger. It's not based on ego. There's nothing he does. It's everything he does, uh, everything I've ever witnessed and everything I've ever read and, and every feeling I ever have is a, is a person that's just completely um, honest and sold to Krishna as his servant. And I, I, can't, I can't envision... Uh, um, uh, I, I would just love to get a... I, when I get a glimpse of his, 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 um, his love, his mercy, uh, is what keeps me keeps me going on. All I do is think of uh, just being in his presence, and I can't, I can't. Uh, and and being in his and it's not it's not pure it's not sentiment. It's it's the real feeling that you have of being protected, knowing that what he says is true, and and that that, that truthfulness and that that love that he shows. Is, is so genuine that it, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a bond that uh, you can't break. Mm -hmm. You can try to give it up, but you can't. You can try to break it, but it's unbreakable. You know, we, we have, uh, we've been bitten. <laughs> we've been infected. So, you know, uh, you could try. Prabhupada, there's, there's a verse in, that says, if you want to forget Krishna, Krishna will show you how to forget. And he'll show you, but uh, if you want to remember, and if you if you have uh, faith in the spiritual master, then you're you're really fortunate. And uh, I'm fortunate enough to to uh, really be uh, uh, a disciple and a follower of Srila Prabhupada. I feel very fortunate for that. Even more so than seeing the qualities in Srila Prabhupada himself, I saw them in the devotees. And, um, and that was really uh, the quality of the people that he attracted was just um, astounding. And it was just such a pleasure to be able to serve with these people and live with these people and um, and they were all like um, you know and 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 also the other thing about Srila Prabhupada 
that was, you know, he wasn't, he went all the way with it. He was all in. And when he was into something, he didn't stop. And, you know, he, uh, he was just focused on it in, until I remember that there was a, a video I saw he was lying on his deathbed. He could barely talk and he was still translating his books. Jai Dwayta Swami was holding up the microphone and he was still translating that last chapter he, on his deathbed. And, um, you know, I just think, you know, whatever you give, give your best. Just give your all. And that was Srila Prabhupada. He was always giving. He didn't hold back. Jai <laughs> Prachur